following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. We are continuing with the lecture that we were addressing last Saturday where we were talking about the sacraments of the Gnostic Church. We must understand we must comprehend uh, all of these uh, topics by utilizing the graphic of the tree of life. It is necessary for the students to comprehend that the Bible, especially, and many other books, are written based on the graphic of the tree of life. Christianity in this day and age uh, is lost into many interpretations of the scriptures because they ignore the study of Kabbalah which is really the tree of life. That's why we, the Gnostics, emphasize the study of this uh, graphic of the tree of life in order to know the messages given by the great masters, including our venerable master, Samael on the Or who stated that a true esotericist should be an alchemist and a Kabbalist. And of course, re uh, remember that alchemy is related to Da'at, the tree of knowledge of the signs of good and evil. And Kabbalah is related with the tree of life, which are two sciences that share the same roots. And that's why when we talk about Kabbalah, we address Da'at alchemy. And uh, related with the Gnostic Church, we always state that the Gnostic Church is the church of our Lord, the Christ. And we always emphasize that Christ is not a person, but an energy, a force, that is that uh, element or that entity that connects all of the tree of life. But we have to understand and comprehend 
about uh, the great master Averamento, Jesus Christ. How is this master associated with the Lord Christ? And how he, uh, is he the vehicle of that force that we call Christ, Avalokiteshvara, Kuan Yin, etc.? To begin, we have to comprehend and understand that the goal of creation is to acquire paramarta, which is absolute knowledge or absolute consciousness, and paranishpana, which means absolute happiness. So, in the universe, life exists because we have to acquire absolute knowledge or, or absolute cognizance of our own particular individuality in relation with the universe in relation with the Absolute. So, the beings that acquire Absolute knowledge of themselves, Absolute knowledge of the Absolute, are called Paramartha Satyas. So, the Master Averamento, known in the earth as Jesus Christ, acquired Paramartha and Paranishpana in previous cosmic days. Nonetheless, he renounced the happiness of, of the unmanifested Absolute in order to come in the universe and save human beings and gods. And this is something that we have to emphasize because it's related with the Gnostic Church. When in that, which is the first abyss that we study from where the universe emerges, the Elohim or glorious Dianis started to weave in the loom of God. When the monads were contemplating the twilight of the uncreated light, they were sobbing, crying, because the uncreated light was sinking as a frightful setting sun. We have to understand that when the cosmic day emerges or started, the monads are resting within the Absolute, enjoying the happiness of the Absolute. But immediately when the cosmic day starts, they have to leave that uncreated light and to emerge into the universe in order to pay or in order to establish themselves and, and to pay the karma of previous manifestations. So when the causal logos began to move upon the face of Shamajim, the primordial waters, of that, the Elohim said to not begin the dawn of the cosmic day yet. But useless was their begging, vain their lament. 
Occasionally, the great being stopped for a while in order to read the karma from those resplendent children of the dawn. Karma that was created in previous cosmic manifestations. Of course, the universe exists because of karma. And those beings knew the errors that were written in the Akashic records. So they knew that their pilgrimage into the universe was something very painful. This is the law. So the Elohim, the Elohim or the gods prayed, they cried a lot as did their Divine Mother with fervor. Hence, everything remained in silence. Then, amidst the quenched sobs of the Akashic waves, only the rumor of existence was heard. So, by utilizing our imagination, we have to see the Sephira Da'at, where these Shamayim, primordial waters, which, just, which are called the Akashic waters, is where, according to the Bible, in the beginning, the causal logos, or the spirit of the Elohim, was floating and creating or initiating our present cosmic day. So, of course, the goal of all of those Elohim, gods or monads, is like the goal of all the beings in the universe. To rest and to enter into the absolute as Paramartha Satyas, with absolute cognizance of themselves. But you cannot remain in the absolute if you have Dharma or Karma. Deaths of reward. In order to enter there, you have to be balanced. No dharma, no karma. So, in that way, you become a paramartha satya, a dweller, inhabitant of the absolute. And you live within the bosom of the father, cosmic father, which is not a person, but the absolute abstract space incomprehensible for us. So let us imagine that moment when the universe was initiated and how those beings were sobbing, crying, because they knew that that light or that creation has to descend from that into all the lower sephiroth in order to crystallize in what we call Malkut, the physical, chemical earth. So that took, of course, a long unfoldment. So in that beginning, the Master Samael on the Or wrote the following. He says in one of his books, Then the Master Averamento, Jesus Christ, as we know him in this planet Earth, the great Paramartha Satya, passed through the Dhyani Pasa. This Dhyani Pasa is the rope of the Dhyanis or spirits, which in theosophy is called the Pass Not Ring, the circle below which are all of those who still labor under the delusion of separateness. So he passed that ring and came into the cosmic garden. He came from the absolute, from the bosom of the absolute into the cosmic garden in order to save the gods whose innumerable virginal sparks or hivas are devolving and evolving during this cosmic day of Mahakalpa. 
The master Samaelon the Or says, I, Samaelon the Or, was a witness of all of these things. I saw when the great being entered the sanctuary, the Gnostic Church. Why are we saying that this sanctuary was the Gnostic Church? Because creation always happens in Da'at, the first abyss of the tree of life. And Da'at means knowledge. And Gnosis means knowledge. So that is, of course, the first sanctuary that appears in creation. is a holy church or temple, or whatever you want to call it, related with Da'at, with knowledge. Where the forces of creation begin to act in the universe. So in that Gnostic church, in that sanctuary, the master Averamento, Jesus Christ, entered and signed a pact of salvation for human beings and gods. And he crucified himself on his cross. So this is what happened in the beginning of this cosmic day. This great being that the people call Jesus Christ, Master of Ramento, came from the Absolute, entered the Gnostic Church and crucified himself there. Why crucified? Because many times we state that that is the dwelling of the two polarities that we call Ava and Aima. Father, mother, the two polarities that are called in uh, Hebrew, Yahava, Yah is the father, and Hava, or Eve, is the mother. So to crucify himself on the cross of the chaos means to initiate through the cross, the vertical cross is the phallus, the horizontal is the feminine yoni, and by the activity of those two forces, positive and negative, masculine and feminine, the universe emerges, and that universe is what we call the sun. And of course, that is a sacrifice, where he is entering to the cross in order to assist those Elohim, to help them, those men at that time, or souls, in the future. Master Samael says, I witnessed the dawn of the cosmic day and I give testimony of all of these things. Later on, at the dawn of the fourth round in which we are right now, this is the fourth round, which is called the terrestrial round, the Master Averamento sent his Buddha. We are here utilizing another word, which is, of course, in Sanskrit, which means an illuminated one, an enlightened one. That means the word Buddha, which in the tree of life is Hesed. That is our internal Buddha according to the tree of life, Hesed, also called Gedula goodness. But in Sanskrit, we call it Buddha. So this master, this Christ, because the master of Veramento is represented in this case when he came out of the Absolute by the three primary forces, Keter, Chokma, and Bina. That's the Logos. That's the Christ. So he sent his Buddha in order for him to prepare himself in this valley of tears. That Buddha is also his soul called Jesus. Or that soul that was born 2,000 years ago in the Holy Land and received the name of Jesus Christ. Let us uh, understand that Jesus means Yeshua, Savior. And since he promised to help from the very beginning, he received the name of Savior. 
But that's the human soul of this great being that we are talking here. Of this great Buddha. And his Buddha lit his seven eternal lamps. In other words, that Buddha worked with the seven uh, tongues of fire or Pentecostal fire related with the seven sephiroths that we find here. From Hesed, Geburah, Tiferet, Netzah, Hot, Yesod, and Malkut. So he rolls those seven serpents to the seven canals, the seven spinal columns of their physical body and internal bodies. Thus, when his Buddha Jesus of Nazareth was prepared there in the Jordan, his resplendent dragon of wisdom, you see, there's another word here, dragon of wisdom is called Christ in other terms. In other words, Christ, the Master of Veramento, enter it within him in order to preach to human beings and gods. So let us understand what is Jesus as a human soul, his Buddha, which is the innermost, and Christ, which is the Master of Veramento, which is the highest part of his being. So the sacrifice already happened on that occasion, in the beginning of these cosmic days. The commander of all cosmic Christs, Jesus of Nazareth, already washed with his blood all the sins of the sanctuary and signed the pact between human beings and Kuan Yin, the army of the voice, Vishnu, Osiris, the great breath or whatever we want to call to that force, because in different religions receive different names. In other words, there are many Christs, or Christified Arabs, but the highest of all of them is the Master of Aramento, because he is a Paramarta Satya. That's why he say, uh, Master Samael says that he is the boss, the head of all the army of the voice. Jesus is the supreme conciliator between the human beings and divinity. So this is precisely what we have to comprehend and understand when we talk about the Christ. Christ is an entity, an energy that can be assimilated by any initiate that self-realizes himself. But those self-realized beings have to fight and to sacrifice themselves in the universe for different humanities in order to gain the right to enter into the bosom of the absolute. So Jesus of Nazareth, the Master of Veramento, did that in past cosmic days. When somebody does that, he enters in the absolute and abandons forever the universe. But the master Averamento, he's an exception by himself because he abandoned the bosom of the Father in order to help us. In other words, he's here because he's on will, but he is not a being that belongs to the universe, belongs to the absolute. And this is something that we have to understand. And his help began. From that, the Holy Gnostic Church of the Chaos. And from that unfolds in different dimensions. So, of course, we explained in the previous lecture how that synthesized the three primary forces, the three amens, which in Hebrew are called El Melech Naaman, which means God the Faithful King. Those are for Aleph, that means El in Hebrew, Melech from Mem, and Naaman, which is Nun. Those are the three words that you made with the word Amen. God the Faithful King. 
indeed, uh, the Amen are the three kings, or the three primary forces that work through the At. And from there, we send on the Tifereth that I was explaining in the previous lecture, that Tifereth is a human soul. That's why you see, you see how through the tree of life we explain the master of Veramenthor came from the absolute and entered into the At in order to work as a Christ for this humanity. Then he sends his Buddha, which is Hesed, and his human soul, which is Tiferet, because really the whole work of the Buddha Averamento, which is the work of the Glorian Averamento, does it through Tiferet, which is the human soul. And that human soul is Tiferet. That's why we always address the middle column of the tree of life in order to understand that. The mantra of Tifereth is Eloa Va Vaat Yov He Va He. This is how we said in esotericism. You see, that is the mantra that you utilize in order to be in contact with Tifereth. I repeat Eloa Va Vaat Yov He Va He. Because he, he reunites all of that. You know that Yod He Vav He is Jahava in that. Eloah is the feminine aspect of the Elohim, the Divine Mother. When you said Va, that means and knowledge. So the whole thing, this is what it called a Bodhisattva. Any Bodhisattva is Eloah Va, that Yod He Vav He a vehicle of Christ. And of course, that's why you find also this uh, Holy Gnostic Church in the sixth dimension. And from the sixth dimension, descends into all the Sephiroth, and finally crystallizes in the fourth. In the fourth dimension, we find the sacred uh, temple of the Gnostic Church. And in the physical plane, Malkut, as we state, when we connect ourselves through the sacraments of this Gnostic Church, we connect to the Church of Yesod, of Hod, Netzai, and all the Sephiroth, directly into that and beyond, which is precisely the Ains of Or, that in Egypt is called Ra, Amon Ra, or Amen Ra. So, any devotee who fulfills the sacraments of that, of the Holy Gnostic Church, can receive the Holy Spirit <coughs> in order to become a priest. Those who want to fulfill the duties of, priest, of priestess must become completely chaste and holy. They must accomplish with the sacraments of the Gnostic Church. So the Gnostic Church is the church of our Master Averamento, Jesus Christ. Such a church is not of this world. This is why he said 2,000 years ago to Pilate. You remember when Jesus was in front of Pilate? the governor of uh, Rome at that time, which in esotericism, he symbolizes the mind, the intellectual mind. Jesus said to Pilate, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then will my servants fight that I should not deliver to the Jews but now is my kingdom not from hence. So now you understand, as the Master Jesus himself said, 
His kingdom is not of this world, and I will explain. But here, of course, we receive assistance because the Holy Gnostic Church that uh, was instituted by him, by the promise that he did in the beginning of his cosmic days, was of course spread in Rome, in the catacombs of Rome. The Gnostics at that time, as you call them Christians in the beginning, were performing those rituals from Egypt. Mary, the physical mother of Jesus, was a vestal in the temples of Egypt. When we talk about Egypt, we have to understand that the Bible talks very clear that Moses came from Egypt. Abraham was in Egypt as well. They were, of course, studying there as Jesus. We know also that Jesus came from Egypt. Because in Egypt was precisely the source of wisdom, of knowledge, of ancient times, from the beginning. From that Neptunian, Amentian uh, epoch that we're talking here, which is the beginning, the creation. So, the names that were utilized at that time, 2,000 years ago, were Egyptian names. Remember that at that time, Christianity was not known as we know it right now. And the ancient Christians or Gnostics were utilizing the names of Egypt that Jesus instituted there when he was uh, doing his ministry among the Jews. And that's why... Still, in this day and age, we the Gnostics utilize the same names. But we explain them. We say that Osiris Ra represents the three primary forces, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen Ra is also the same thing, because Amen represents the three primary forces. The three main letters of the word Amen. So Amen Ra, Osiris Ra, etc., is that. Of course, uh, the idols that the Bible talk about, that Moses was rejecting in the beginning, and that also Mohammed destroyed, are not physical statues, but ideologies, fanaticism, dogmas, that existed at that time. Because people were worshipping idols, meaning images of their own mind, of their own intellect interpretations of their own uh, religion, etc. Those are, are the idols that the Bible refers to. Still, people have idols. For instance, if we do not work seriously in ourselves, we can make of Jesus of Nazareth an idol within our mind. We can make an idol of Buddha, we can make an idol or some idol on the or. And that's precisely the danger when we enter into these studies. That's why in the previous lecture we stated that the first commandment is you shall not have any image of any Elohim before me. This is what God says. You, have, you have, shall not have any image of any Elohim before me. When you said before him, means your inner God. Don't make any image of any Elohim when you connect to your inner being. Because you shall love thy God with all your mind, with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your uh, soul. That implies, of course, a psychological work. Because as long as we have images of false images in the mind about God, we are worshipping idols in a certain level. This humanity worship idols in 97%. And only 3% are real worshippers. I mean, in sight, psychologically speaking. So we had to annihilate little by little 
defects, vices, and errors in order not to worship idols. And uh, that is what is the Gnostic Church. That's why the sacrament related to confirmation enters into us when we were, I said, teenagers. So, at that age, we have to confirm the work that we are doing in our three brains. And we explained that in order to work with the three brains, we have to know how to meditate and to study psychology. The answer that the Master Jesus of Nazareth was given to the young rich man, we explain, is a message that we had to understand psychologically. Because the rich men represent each one of us. This rich or wealth that is uh, uh, pointed in the Bible has nothing to do with materiality, with money. But has to do with materiality, of course, because it is related with the mind. The complex of being more When you feel that you are better than, or holier than, better than, that is what in the Bible is written as, to be rich, to have more. Unfortunately, all of us have that complex of being more or wealthy than others, psychologically speaking. So when you enter precisely in your teenage at that age, if you remember or if you observe yourselves, you have always that complex of trying to be better than others. And of course, it's because the hormones of the physical body are developing. And you want to find your place in the universe, in the world. So when this symbology of this uh, young man come to Jesus, At that age, that youngster, he says, Master, what should I do in order to inherit the kingdom of God? The Master says, you know the commandments. And he says, well, since my my childhood, I accomplished all of those commandments. Now, says the Master, give away all that you have and follow me. Give it to the poor. Of course, the poor in this case are those that lack the knowledge. Have to give them. But as well, give away all that we have is to get rid of all the defects, vices, and errors that we have in abundance. And in order to finish with that statement, Master Jesus said, other men asked him, What is the best of all commandments? The first one. And then the Baptist says, Hear, O Israel, your God is one. Or in other words, you have to make of your own God one in in, in yourself. You have to love thy God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And the neighbor as thyself. All of these, these commandments enclose all the commandments. If you fulfill that, you are doing well. People read that, but they don't realize that Master Jesus is addressing the three brains that we have. The mind, intellectual brain, the emotional brain, the soul, which is related with the pineal gland, and the strength, which is related with the motor instinctual sexual brain, where we find the strength, the energy, to be alive, to act. 
So to love our God with all our heart is to build for the Lord the astral body and to work against all of those defects that we have in the heart, self-esteem, fear, pride, vanity, etc. To love thy God with all your mind means to build for your inner God a solar mental body that will serve the Lord. And for that also we have to annihilate the defects and vices that we have in the mind. And to love our God with all our soul is to build for our inner God a body that will be the vessel for the soul. So then, when we have those three bodies, astral, mental, and causal, we start delivering all the strength, all the power of our physical body to God. But we have to work against, of course, the obstacles. Because we are rich, psychologically speaking, and we have to be poor. Because, blessed be the poor, because the kingdom of heaven is for them. But that poor in the spirit is something that you have to acquire by working in yourself psychologically. It's not something that you will acquire because believing in something. You have to work. And by doing that is how you prepare yourself for the fifth sacrament, which is matrimony. Matrimony is, of course, the sacrament that all of us should prepare or should perform after we leave uh, the teenage when we reach the 21 years of age as a man and a woman at least 18. That's the age in order to get married. Not to reproduce ourselves as animals. Because Jesus didn't come and instituted the matrimony in order for us to multiply like animals. Matrimony, the sacrament of matrimony is, as you said, a sac sacred amen. The way in which we have to learn how to unite the Amen, the Aleph, the Mem, and the Nun, which in the previous lecture we explained. Aleph is the wind in Kabbalah, the air, the blow, the, the breath of God that blows into the nostril of the human being. Mem is the water. That water is in the sexual organs. That we should know how to handle it in the matrimony. That the end feminist of the alchemists. And the nun is a fish. In Aramaic. Nun means fish. So that's the word amen. The fish. The salt of the earth. That you have to transmute. That's why in the matrimony is precisely where we give the first step towards the Christification or the realization of the three primary forces, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in the soul, in the body, in the mind, and in the spirit. And this is where in the matrimony we accomplish the mysteries of baptism. That were taught when we were child or we were children. We receive the sacraments of baptism as a symbol. Now, as an adult in matrimony, we have to perform that baptism with with acts, with actions. Because the previous baptism was a symbol that we explained very well in the previous lecture. When I talk about this baptism, also come into my mind. The tradition of the Hebrews, that when the child is born, the baptism for them is to make the circumcision to the men, to cut the flesh that gives that animal sensation to the phallus or the male. 
So that is, of course, the similitude or comparison that we do with baptism and circumcision. But if you receive the circumcision in it, when you are a child and when you marry, you marry just to multiply like animals, then you are not performing the circumcision of the spirit, which is the main thing. As Paul of Tarsus has stated, it is better to be circumcised in the spirit, even though we are not circumcised in the flesh. But of course, that circumcision was a pact given of God with Abraham in order to teach them. Why the circumcision? Well, when the couple marry, then they know why the circumcision. So they perform the sexual act. And they start, of course, avoiding the animal instinct, which represents the flesh of, uh, of the phallus in the man. And both men and women start to transmute their mem. You see? Listen, their mem, their water, or the word amen, which is the sexual energy, the sexual matter. Transmute that into wine. That's why the Master Jesus made the miracle of alchemy or what we call the transubstantiation. What is the transubstantiation? The transubstantiation is the change of what substance into another. The water is one substance. The wine is another. So Jesus made that transubstantiation in the weddings of Cana. Not because we wanted to, to, he wanted to feel it or to give uh, wine to drunkards in order to be happy. Because a prophet, an avatar, doesn't do that. Everything that an avatar or a prophet does is with a purpose. So the transmutation of water into wine in the weddings of Cana is made or was made with a purpose of teaching to the married couple, that they should perform the sexual act like animals, but they should transmute their water, sexual water, into the wine of the spirit. That transubstantiation is symbolized by the Eucharist. You see? Now we go back into the sacrament of the Eucharist, which is called the First Communion. The word itself and clarifies everything, clarifies everything. Communion. The first communion means the first common union. In this case, in the matrimony, the first common union is the sexual act. Because all of us come from that communion or that union of men and women. That's why we are here. All of us are children of a man and a woman and a sexual act. But Jesus was starting and teaching that, the transmutation of, wine, of uh, water into wine, in order to teach the transubstantiation, which is a miracle that occurs in the first communion when you are in the church. The priest that represents the Holy Spirit is transforming the bread and the wine that is there present in the Eucharist is charging it with the solar force of the ends of ore, with Ra, with the forces of Christ that descend in a ceremony. Of course, in order for a priest to do that, he has to previously perform the other sacraments. Because the priest doesn't know this that we are talking here, about here. We are talking about this here, but many priests, many uh, individuals that are in different churches of Christianity, ignore about this. So then, in order to be a bishop, you have to be married. Bishop is somebody that oversees, you know, this is, the, this is a watcher. 
that has the chakra of clairvoyance awakened. Because single people can be a priest. They can be a priest, like a, 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 we call it a, a, a monk. The way of the monk starts when you are single, when you are not married. But it's a preparation for the marriage because a true priest, a true bishop, is a married one, not a single. Because in order to develop the sacrament of the priesthood, which is the sixth sacrament of the Gnostic Church, you have to be married because you have to baptize yourself with the waters which is the baptism, you have to receive the first communion. You have to endure all the ordeals. And that's precisely the institution of uh, sacrament of matrimony in order to do that. Let me read for you what is written by Paul of Tarsus in his letter, first letter to Timothy, chapter 3, verse 1 to 16, talking about a real priest or a bishop. He says, This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desire good work. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife. Vigilant, sober, of good behavior given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, no greedy or filthy looker, but patient, not a brawler, not a covetous, one who rules well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. You see, even point here that a bishop, a priest, can have children. Because he's married. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? And remember that the church of God comes from that, down to Yesod, which is related with sex. Many of these great priests in the beginning, like... Uh, Peter, the apostle, were married because they knew about the mystery of that. But later on, with time, they lost the tradition. And they remained being priests only in half. And of course, priesthood is related with the three lower sephirah that we find here. Netzah, Hod, and Yesod. The mind the heart, and the sex, the strength. Remember that Tifereth, the human soul, is precisely the one that performs in the physical world, which is Malkut, the priesthood. When you find somebody that says, I am a priest, you are talking with a soul of somebody that is in that physical body. So the human soul, Tifereth, is in the physical body and he has to learn, or he's learning, performing, how to love their own God with all their mind, Netzah, the mind, with all their heart, the astral body, with all their strength, with their sexual force. That is the priesthood. And that's why most, in all religions, in order to become or to be a priest, you have to take care of your sexual energy. Let's see only the Catholic Church. Most of them are, they are celibate. Or well, they try to be celibate. But of course, uh, in the Bible, it's written about uh, uh, how to be a priest. And it's written here, I have uh, uh, copies of it, in order for you see. The Pharisees also came unto Jesus, 
trying to tempt him. And he was teaching these mysteries or sacraments. And saying unto him, It is lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause. You see? In this case, in priesthood, they said that they don't want to be, have a wife. They want to be singles. And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? It's written in Genesis. When God created the human being, he created male, female. Not just male. Male, female. For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife. And they twain shall be one flesh. You see? Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Then they answered to Jesus, Why then did Moses command us to give a writing to divorce and put our wives away? And then Jesus says, Moses did that because of the hardness of your hearts. Suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not in that way. And of course in order to serve God. In order to work with the forces of God. You need the two polarities. Man and, and woman. Male, female. Nobody can create life only with one polarity. And the same the sacraments. If you work in the sacraments with only one polarity, how is it going to do it? How is it going to work? We need to, uh, uh, to study the sacraments or the three men that always work with the priest and the priestess. This is how it was in the beginning in, in, the, in, the, in church of, uh, of Rome, in the catacombs. There was the Isis, that is called the priestess, and the priest, which was representing Osiris of ancient Egypt. And of course, and then the, he says, Whosoever shall put away his wife except for fornication, and shall marry another, commits adultery. And whosoever marries her, which is put away, also commit adultery. And then they answer, If that is the case of the man, be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. And then Jesus answered unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. And then he answered the following. That is written in Matthew 19 chapter 9 12. For there are some eunuchs. Which, are, which were so born from their mother's womb. And there are some eunuchs. Which were made eunuchs of men. And there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive this, let him receive it. What is a eunuch? A eunuch, according to the dictionary, is somebody that his testicles are cut. But there are some, that says, that are uh, being born as eunuchs from their mother's womb. And another, the master says, the third aspect says, and there are others that make themselves eunuchs because of the sake of the kingdom of heaven. In other words, to become a eunuch because of the kingdom of heaven is a mystery of alchemy. It doesn't mean that the man has to go and cut his testicles in order to become a eunuch for the kingdom of God. You have to do it. You have to work in yourself. 
And in order to understand this uh, statement that Master Jesus gave in Matthew, let us read Corinthians, one verse of Corinthians. It's easy. It says, But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remains that both they that have wives be as thou they have none. Corinthians 7, 29. How is that that those that have wife be as if they don't have it? By being a eunuch by the kingdom of God because of the kingdom of heaven, you understand how to become in that way. And you become a eunuch in that way when you know the mystery of alchemy. When you don't reproduce yourself like an animal and you transmute your water into wine. And for that, of course, the Master Samael on the Or wrote the perfect matrimony in many books where he teaches how to become a eunuch according to the kingdom of God, which means how to learn sexual magic, sexual transmutation, in order to become a real bishop of God or a priest. Of course, in a priesthood, you know very well that the one that receives The development of priesthood is capable of do magic. And this is something that many Christians uh, scandal or get fear of when they hear the word magic. But the word magic, many times we state it, comes from the Sanskrit. Mag, or from the language mag, which is coming from Persia, some ancient language. Mag means priest. A priest is a mag. Why is a mag a priest? Because the priesthood has to be performed, as we have stated, in these three sephiroth, according to Kabbalah, Netzah, Hod, and Yesod. These are the three types of priesthood that anybody develops when entering into the sacrament of priesthood. But in order for you to develop this, you have to annihilate your ego. This is something that we have to comprehend and understand. Christ, which is an energy that descends from above, has to develop in the human soul. Understand that, comprehend that. See the tree of life. We repeat. Tifereth is the human soul. And Malkut is the physical body of that human soul. That human soul has to conquer these four sephiroth that are below. Netzah, the mind. Hod, the emotional astral body. Yesod, the vital strength. Sex and Malkut. Here, this physical world. And in Malkut, of course, it's called the kingdom. Malkut means the kingdom. And in order for it to be a kingdom, we need a queen and a king. Because if there is a kingdom without a king, there is not a kingdom. If there is a kingdom without a queen, there is not a kingdom. So the priest and the priestess, the king and the, and, and the queen which is called the Malakim. Why are they called the Malakim? In, in, in Hebrew language, Kabbalah, Malek means kin. Malka, squin. Born together, Malakim. And Malakim is a name in the world of magic, in the world of priesthood, in Tifereth, of Tifereth. Malakim is called, the Malakim. Sometimes in, in the Hebrew language they call the Malakim, the angels. The Malakim, the prophets. The Malakim, the masters. Of course, that is our goal, to become a Malakim. And for that, remember, that is the sacred name of priesthood for the soul. So the soul that is a Malakim 
has to exercise power in the four lower sephiroths. And the lower sephiroths are the ones that have the ego, the mind. You see, when we talk about the mind is netzah, hod is a heart, negative emotions, and sex is yasod. These three sephiroths, netzah, hod, and netzah, manifest in the in Malkut, the physical body, through the three brains. Three brains that we have. The intellectual brain, the emotional brain, and the sexual instinctual uh, brain. So then, Master uh, Jesus, in the Bible, is always showing power of priesthood. When, for instance, the multitudes are listening to him and he's teaching the, the great uh, 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 lecture or the great uh, preaching in the mountain, when he is teaching the blessings, blessing be the poor, uh, 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 etc., etc., and uh, when he sees all the multitudes, the apostles are worried. Because they said, Master, how are we going to feed all of these thousands of people? There are many women, children here. And they are gathering here, you are teaching them, but sooner or later they need to feed their physical bodies. And then he performs what people call a miracle. In other words, he performs the priesthood of Yesod. He has power in Yesod which is the fourth dimension. He placed, listen what he did, Master Jesus placed all of those multitudes into the fourth dimension. To put all of that people into the fourth dimension in order to feed them with fish. Of course, it's also a symbol there hidden within that uh, miracle, within that prodigy that he performed as a real priest because he says Jesus was a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Meaning those people that understand the sacraments of the Gnostic Church from the chaos, from the beginning. So then, it is written there that the great priest Jesus fed all those people, women and children, gave them fish and bread. That is only possible by knowing how to enter into the higher dimension, the fourth dimension, into that dimension that we call the land of Avalon, Eden. Of course, the miracle of the transubstantiation, which is performed, in the Sephira Hod, or related with the Sephira Hod, is a miracle that is performed not only in, the, in Christianity. The transformation of the bread and the wine into the Eucharist is a miracle that can be performed by any priest that follows the sacraments that we are touching, talking here. As Jesus transformed the water into wine in the mysteries of Yesod, that's the priesthood of Yesod, to transmute the waters into wine. To make the wine and the bread the vehicle or the flesh of Christ is another magic or another priesthood that any initiate has to perform. Not only in front of the public, but in privacy. Why? Because the cosmic Christ which is an energy, needs to guide you. And you need him to be guided by him. The Lord, the cosmic Christ, is not a person. Even though he utilizes his avatars, messengers, prophets, in order to teach, in order to perform miracles. But he's an energy that has to be assimilated by each one of us. By every Tifereth, by every human soul. 
And uh, this human soul in the physical world, Malkut, has to fight against another abyss, another chaos, which is below, which is called Klipoth. In that abyss, in that Klipoth, we have lust, anger, greed, vanity, laziness. That is our subconsciousness, our unconsciousness, or infra consciousness. And everybody carries Klipoth or that abyss inside. All of those enemies of the Lord, the unfaithful ones, is how Muhammad called them. The unfaithful ones that need to be annihilated. But we need to enter and to make light in the darkness. How do we make light in the darkness? In this physical plane in which we are. We need help. So therefore, Jesus instituted the Eucharist. Instituted the Last Supper. Which is a miracle, is a, a magic ceremony in which the priest brings the solar fire of the ends of or from Tum, which is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, descends to that, which is Jahava, or, or Jehovah, as we say in the Bible, and descends directly in the soul, which is Tifereth. And the soul receives it, and place it into the bread and to the wine of the Eucharist when he is blessing it. But he is, of course, a channel of Christ in that very moment. It becomes a, a prophet. But he, I repeat, that priest that, that is performing that knows about all the sacraments. It is impossible to channel the force of Christ if you are a fornicator. In other words, if you are losing your sexual matter. Because the Lord needs the channel, which is the solar force, in order to channel the, 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 the solar force. And this is why when the priest blesses the wine and pronounces the words, in order for that solar light to enter through his hands and to the channel that he is opening in the ceremony, enters into the wine and into the bread, the Eucharist. And when he delivers that to the students, to the neophytes, to the devotees, they receive, when they eat that bread, when they drink that wine, they receive those solar atoms that came down through that channel into Makut. And they, that, uh, those solar atoms, by eating the bread and the wine, goes into the heart. And in the heart... Strengthen the atom nous, and then you receive energy in order to comprehend yourself, in order to start doing your work and to be united with your Father. Remember, no one goes to the Father but through me. That's one of the channels that is called the Eucharist. But I repeat, listen carefully. If the priest is a fornicator, that miracle doesn't happen. Because first you have to follow the sacraments in order to perform it. In order to bring that energy down and to help others. It is not necessary, for instance, to belong to the second chamber as well in order to perform this. Matthew Samael explains that every single Gnostic can have his altar in his home and when he performed the transmutation, after performing the transmutation, the sexual transmutation, he can go and bless the wine and the bread. And moreover, he can perform the pankatatwa ritual. He can have a piece of fish. He can have a piece of meat, small, not a big. And to eat it after the performing of the sexual transmutation, then you are with the blessing of that because you are charging yourself with your own energy. You are eating the four elements. The water in the fish, the fire in the, in the meat, the earth in the bread, the wheat, 
and the air in the wine or in the grape juice. We said wine, but uh, shouldn't be with alcohol. Should be grape. We call wine with a, with a grape juice. So this is a sacrament where the Lord is present. That's why when Jesus was performing that miracle in the Last Supper, his inner being, Averamento, who is the head of all the Christ, of all the energy in this planet, was there present. But we, the Gnostics, we connect to that ceremony through the performance of the rituals of the Last Supper. And that we do in, in, in a gathering, in groups, and when we are by ourselves. Because I repeat, every single Gnostic has his altar with a crucifix that symbolizes the Lord, the Christ, the sacrifice, the Divine Mother, and can have the Pankatatwa ritual with the four elements. In different religions, they celebrate this in different ways. But I repeat, in order for that to have strength, to have force, the priest and the priestess had to be in chastity. They had to transmute the water into wine. They had to transmute the sexual energy. Otherwise, it doesn't work because the Lord is the energy, the force. And that's the sacrament of Hod, the sacrament of Netzah, which is the mind, is also the performing of the priesthood with nature. I remember when we uh, were in Mexico, Master Samael on the or were performing the ritual of, of Netza, the mind, with a lot of people. First, he was giving a lecture. And after that, he was healing them in their mind, their heart, in their physical bodies by utilizing the magic of Netza, which is really simple. To put yourself in contact with the forces of nature, with the elementals of nature, the plants, the flowers, the animals, the dust related with the mind. Jesus also performed that. He was performing sacred mantras. Of course, it's not a mantra as it says in the Bible, because mantra is a Sanskrit word. But what's a word that was pronounced there in the Bible that said that he pronounced that word and was making a theft. Uh, I mean, a theft, right? Those that cannot hear. Deaf. The deaf. Healing the deaf by pronouncing the mantra of the sacred word, Ephata, is how it's written in the book of Mark. Or, in order to resuscitate physically, he was pronouncing Talita Kumi. It's written also in the Gospels. Those are sacred words, mantras, that only have power when you are performing the sacrament of priesthood, which is related with Peter. Remember that Peter is the one that has the keys. And the Master Jesus says, Upon this stone, which is means Peter, I will build my church. We, individually, have to be a church, a temple of God. And Peter, which is seated in the pineal gland, has to control, through the pineal gland, the three priesthoods. Because the pineal gland is related with Tiferet. You see? The card stated, the pineal gland is a seat of the soul. What soul? The human soul, Tiferet. And in that pineal gland is Peter. Because the one that is the priest is Tifereth, the human soul, through Peter. And from that, the soul, through Peter, works with a stone in the sexual matrimony, sexual magic, the sacrament of the holy matrimony. And through the stone of Hod, he performs the Eucharist, in order to help the neophytes. That were, in the ancient times, the priests were, of course, performing the Eucharist in order to receive the new souls 
and to receive the strength of the Lord in themselves through the ritual of the Eucharist, where we receive the communion, the first communion, the baptism as a symbol, also the confirmation. Also, we, we marry there as a ceremony, and also we receive the, bow, the, the vows of uh, priesthood in a church. But if we receive all of that symbolically and we don't perform that inside, it's just lust. Because every man has to be a priest and every woman a priestess, according to the order of Melchizedek, in order to perform what we call the extreme unction or the healing. In Gnosticism, we have many ways in order to heal the sick. It's not something that we invented in this epoch. Those are rituals, those are ceremonies from ancient times, very old, that we were performing in Rome in the time of Jesus, that we were performing in Egypt in the time of Moses, and beyond in Atlantis with Noah. Ceremonies in which we heal the sick. Physically, mentally, emotionally. Why? Not that when we said we heal is is wrong because it's not we that do it, but the superior beings that assist us because we invoke them to their different uh, invocations, rituals that we know. We can invoke the angels, masters, the divas, in order to assist us, in order to heal. But we know, I repeat, remember, in order to perform these rituals of healing, which is extreme unction, power of the priest, we have to know the law of karma. Because you cannot break the law of karma impunity. Every single healing or everything that we do, we always invoke our inner being and ask permission to the laws of the law. Because there are uh, sicknesses in the mind, in the heart, or in the physical body that are karma duro, which are non negotiable. And uh, we, have to, we have to do the effort in order to heal. But if the sickness is karmic, at least we do the effort in order to heal. But when it is not karmic, automatically the neophyte, the, the soul is healed in his mind, soul, and body. So we know that because the master Samael on the earth left us a lot of practices in order to do the priesthood of Yetzirah is called, in which we learn the priesthood of Yesod, which is sexual magic, the priesthood of Hol, which is the Eucharist, and the priesthood of Netzah, which is, of course, related with the mind, in which we send the energy through chains in order to heal the sick, or in order to reject negative forces. And you can do that also individually. We have in our website and many books all of those uh, secrets, all those clues for you to utilize. But remember, we need to work very hard in the annihilation of the ego in order to accomplish with these sacraments given from the beginning by Christ, by the Master of Veramento. Anyone, that's why it is, it is stated, anyone that pronounces himself or herself against any of these sacraments is a black magician. Anyone. Because he's not pronouncing themselves against uh, uh, any physical institution. Because the physical institutions that are here in this physical world are just physical institutions that we form in order to deliver this knowledge. But Christ is the one that manifests himself when we transmute the sexual energy. We are working with the force of Christ. 
when we are performing the rituals of Hod, the Eucharist, we are working with Christ. When we are performing the healings, etc., we are working with Christ, which is an energy. So if you pronounce yourselves against any of these three priesthoods, you are pronouncing yourselves against Christ. So therefore, you become a black magician. And that's precisely because there are many black magicians that work in Klippoth, that know many rituals, but they don't obey the sacraments. So therefore, in Klippoth you have the negative polarity of all of this that we are teaching here. That's why the Master explains in his book, The Perfect Matrimony, that are also black masses. Those black masses that are pronouncing Malkut, but that they not channel Christ. They channel the forces of Klippoth. But there are people that gather that they are not in chastity. They accept homosexuality, lesbianism, and all of that uh, degeneration. So, of course, when they perform the ritual, they channel forces from Klippoth, from the abyss, not from above. Because in order to channel from above, you have to accomplish with the sacraments given by the Master Jesus. And if you pronounce yourself against any of these sacraments, like the Master Samuel explained his perfect matrimony, that there are many individuals in this day and age that cunningly explain that the Eucharist is bad for your soul. That the Eucharist is dangerous for your development. So therefore, don't perform that. Those that say that are black magicians. Because they are pronouncing themselves against Christ. Not against us. Against Christ. Because Christ manifests to those rituals. And when they say, be careful with the practices that are in the book of medicine, or in other books that the Master of Samael wrote because they are black, they are pronouncing themselves against the healing forces of the mind that work through Christ. And they call themselves Gnostics. Because anybody can use that word easily. It's just easy to open your mouth and say, I am a Gnostic. And then uh, gather and teach wrong things to the public. That's why we are teaching these lectures here and explaining that, that everything has to be in relation with Kabbalah. Anyone that says that the rituals of Hor are dangerous, or the rituals of Netzah are dangerous as well, well, they are pronouncing themselves against the Lord, Christ. And anyone that pronounces themselves against Christ is against Christ. That's why the Lord says, those that are not with me are against me. So, this is a warning because, I repeat, there are many so-called Gnostics that think that they are following uh, this master or that other master that teaches that the rituals of hold are wrong, are bad. No. What is bad is to have the ego inside and to participate in those rituals without annihilating the ego. Because in order to perform, listen carefully, in order to perform perfectly, the ritual of Yesod, or the sacrament of Hod, of Netzah, in order to perform it perfectly, to perform the priesthood in a perfect 100%, you have to annihilate your ego. So, that's why those that are being born as masters in the internal planes, they have to work very hard in order to annihilate the ego. Because the Master Samael was performing the rituals of priesthood of Yatsira in Mexico. Very powerful. Why? Because he didn't have ego. For us, with ego, we perform it according to the level of consciousness that we have awakened. But uh, little by little, as we advance in the annihilation of the ego, that priesthood, power of priesthood, is developed until we reach 100%. And we become then priests of God according to the order of Melchizedek. 
But we have to start from the beginning doing this uh, priesthoods that work according to our level because we need help in order to go ahead because we have a lot of karma to pay. Do you have questions? Well, the synthesizing the question here, he's asking that if the different hierarchies, gods, angels, whatever, have different uh, levels of consciousness or perfection according to the development of Christ within them. Yes, of course. Christ is the source the, of enlightenment, of knowledge, of wisdom in each one of us when we start walking on this path. So he gives that in different levels the goal of any initiate is to reach the Venustic initiation in order to receive that help special help from the Savior in which he enters as a Savior into that Bodhisattva onto that human soul that already reached mastery to Tifereth and of course he will develop the reasoning, the objective reasoning of that Bodhisattva according to the circumstances, according to the karma. And then to acquire another level of objective reasoning. So the gods, the angels, divas, or whatever you call them, masters, prophets, have different levels of understanding, different levels of comprehension, because the light shines in different uh, levels, different powers. Yeah. The lights are like bulbs. I mean, the prophets are like bulbs, receptacles that shine the light of Christ, the solar light, according to their own development, their own capacity as well. But that is something that you have to develop with your psychological work. And according to that level is how also you deliver and you see things and you comprehend things remember that in the lecture we stated that there are six levels of objective reasoning master Jesus of Nazareth master of Ramento has the level that we call unclad very high very high I know there are levels that are below him and uh, that they don't comprehend him yet is a level that belongs to the absolute, the bosom of the absolute. But of course, uh, when we develop our own particular uh, level, then the Master Jesus teaches what we need to learn, what we need to learn, what we need to know. And since He is in the top of all the levels of objective reasoning, He's capable of teaching each one of us. He's, take, he's capable of saving, in other words, inside of us, our souls and spirits. Because he already reached that level. That's why he's a savior. This is what we have to understand. He is what we call the patriarch of the Gnostic Church. And of course, in the Gnostic Church are many patriarchs. Matthew Samael on Veor is another patriarch of the Gnostic Church. In order to become a patriarch, you have to annihilate your ego. And then you become a channel of the Lord, completely. But a bodhisattva with ego still is in process. We cannot call him a patriarch. Maybe an apostle, or bishop. Because you know, in order to be a bishop, you have to be married. You developed, but from bishop, you have to go to apostle. Apostle is somebody that incarnates 
as a Bodhisattva that follow the direct path, the Lord, that's an apostle. And from apostle can become a patriarch. If he annihilates the ego, because if he doesn't annihilate the ego, cannot become a patriarch. It's a vehicle. It's patriarch is something very, for the Gnostic Church, this is something very, really, very uh, heavy. That's why we know uh, Archbishop of the Gnostic Church in the internal worlds is also the master Guiracocha. But he cannot be an avatar because he still has ego. That's why I said the master Samael is an avatar. He's a patriarch because he annihilated his ego. But those people that call themselves patriarchs here in this physical world with the ego alive is just a joke. Maybe bishops. But in the strict sense of Kabbalah, alchemy, we need to work very hard. Apostles, yeah. You can come if you follow the direct path. But don't pronounce yourself against Hod or against Netzah because you are pronouncing yourself against your Lord. That's, that's, that's precisely the mistake of Brutus that pronounced himself against the patriarch in the Gnostic Church and abandoned the temple in the eternal plains, insulting and doing things to the Master Samael on the earth. It's written there in the called Mystery of the Golden Blossom. Do you have another question? Yeah, what? Yeah, listen. Okay. I'm sorry, um, you mentioned uh, Yahweh and Yahweh, yeah. Okay, the question is that I pronounce, it said yod heh he and I pronounce uh, different ways of pronouncing it. Uh, the tetragrammaton, the sacred name of God, according to Kabbalah, is yod heh vav he, which uh, in the Bible is translated as Jehovah. But Kabbalistically, we said yod hava, but we can also say yah hava. So this is two ways to say Jahava because Jah, remember the word uh, Hallelujah, which means worship Jah. Jah in this case is Keter, Choma, Bina, the three primary forces together. That's Jah, which vibrates in Keter. Hallelujah, worship, praise Christ above. But when that Jah expresses itself as creator, does it do that? That Jah needs Mem, the water, which is Chava, Eve, or Aima, the mother. So when we said Jahava, we are pointing that. That's Jah, Chava. Or as the Bible called Jehovah, the creator. This is a force. That expresses in every single Elohim, any single God. And uh, do not mistake that with Yahweh, because Yahweh is a completely negative name related to the boss of the Black Lodge in Klippoth. It's a demon. And in order to write the name of that demon in Hebrew, Unfortunately, you utilize the same four letters. And that's why the Black Lodge intentionally mistake or mingle that name with Yod Hebabhe. Because it's how you, you write it in Hebrew. But Jave is not uh, uh, Jahava, Jave is a demon of the Black Lodge. Another question. What benefits have a single person with an altar in home? Do they, uh, does he have the same benefits of the married couple? Of course not. Because the married couple is channeling, uh, working with three forces when they perform the transmutation. The single one is receiving help according to his own level. 
Remember that uh, as a single person channels only his own level. If he wants to channel higher forces, strong ones, he needs the woman, or the woman needs the man. Because the woman in the sexual act, united with the man, works with positive, negative, and neutral, which is a sexual connection. And those forces developed in the physical body of both. So they channel higher forces, or the three primary forces. While a single person can channel also, but according to his own development. And will bring into the physical body the forces of Christ as well, if this person is in chastity, if he's working himself, and receive that help. That's why uh, those single people that are uh, needed more strength, they need to go to a Gnostic center, where they celebrate these rituals. They have to gain the right to enter in order to receive the force that is always channeled by a priest that is married, that is working with the sacraments. And also the singles can perform the anshan at home. Yeah, of course. They can perform the anshan. The word, uh, the book uh, called the seven words, which is uh, in the book uh, Logos Mantra Theurgy. There is the seven words. Where the Master Samael explains all of this. For singles and for married people. You can do it. All of these sacraments are necessary. Don't think, honestly, like, oh, we can do it without it. No. If they were instituted by Master Jesus and were left by the Master Samael on the earth, it's because they are necessary. If you think that you can do it without it, well, try. We will see how far you can go. The yellow book. They, uh, he then writes uh, uh, some of the symbols that you have to have in the altar. And the, uh, the golden blossom, he explains about the Pankatadva ritual and the perfect matrimony as well. You have to have a place where you have to magnetize, have your altar in order to uh, bring the forces of the Lord down because we need the Lord. Nobody goes to the Father but through me, said the Lord, the cosmic Christ. So, if there is not other uh, question, thank you very much, and have a nice weekend. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing. Available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Amen.